special song and thank you for playing it. The words of that song, there was Jesus. I want to highlight the words before I pray. For this man who needs amazing kind of grace, that's me and you, for forgiveness and a price I couldn't pay. I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. Let's pray. There you are, Jesus. Every minute, every moment, there you are. All the places that we've been and everywhere we're going, there you are. Even when we don't know it, when we can't see you, there you are. Thank you so much for always being there. Thank you for engaging us. Thank you, Lord, that you are here in our midst right now. So fill this place, O Lord, with focus upon you, that we may worship you, that we may live for you, that we may serve you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Blessings to you. As you see, we are trying to be as safe as possible, so I'll be wearing this mask and using a handheld. But all of this is with the heart and the purpose of having clean hands and a pure heart before the Lord. And so these things, may they just be reminders. We want to be safe, but we want them to be reminders of us focusing upon the Lord. Just want to also highlight how um, we are broadcasting right now on Facebook Live. And so aloha, everyone on Facebook Live. It's so good that you have joined us. And thank you for those of you who are here with us now. It is very special to be in the house of God together. And so as we gather in worship and praise and dedication, may this message be an encouragement to us all. We're going to just jump into scripture today. And so we're going to look at John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. John chapter 8, 1 through 11. You know, some Bibles and earlier manuscripts, they may not have this story, but today we are redeeming it for the glory of Christ. And so it is here that we are be looking at several theological truths that are so applicable to our lives. We're just going to, what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to read scripture, and then I'm going to do an inductive style, meaning that I will give some insight as we read through scripture. And then later on, I have some points that I would like us to, to see and hear and to apply into our lives. So starting at verse 1. John chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. Last week, Pastor Clive, you know, Pastor Clive and I, we've been having so much fun discussing this, where he preached last week, I was preaching this week, even last week, as he was preaching, I was taking all these notes, thinking, wow, this is so good, and then I'm th- I changed my pen, could change colors, I changed it to a different color, oh, this is what I'm going to say, and it was so encouraging and neat how God was orchestrating these two sermons together. But last week, Pastor Clive talked about Jarius, and he talked about a woman who was bleeding, And in that he shared, these were two people who were coming to Jesus. They were seeking Jesus for a healing touch. For for them to be able to go and take effort was important. But in today's story, we see a woman caught in adultery as she is dragged to Jesus. She is being brought before him in accusation. So she wasn't looking for Jesus, and yet here she is being dragged to Jesus. And that's kind of interesting because in our lives, what's neat about these two sermons is in our lives, sometimes we need to be seeking desperately, where is Jesus, and going whatever we can, however we can to seek him. But sometimes it just so happens that Jesus is there. 
Maybe you're not even looking for him. Jesus is there. Or maybe it's your sin that drags you there. And when you suddenly look up, there's Jesus. And it's neat that Jesus always engages us. He is always there. And that is something encouraging for us to see. Where Clive also, he talked about how in his story, Jesus was dealing with the physical aspects of healing, of supernatural healing, that is. We see a new aspect of this, and this aspect is the spiritual side, in which Jesus, yes, this woman was caught in adultery. Yes, she needed to be saved from it, but that's the physical side. But there was something way more deeper at the core. There's sin. And sin can only be dealt with spiritually. And Jesus is here revealing himself as the spiritual God who intervenes in this moment. And it is neat to see the, both of these components once again. So there are a lot of similarities, comparisons, contrasts, but all of it, all of it leads back to a Jesus who engages Continuing on in verse 4. They said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? So you see these leaders of the law. They're actually pointing out the law. And they're saying that what this woman has done in the sinfulness of what she has done, there is a consequence And that consequence is to stone her. Kind of interesting how the guy wasn't there, right? There's just the woman. And so it kind of shows a revelation of even right here, these teachers of the law, they either excuse the guy or let him slide away. And so they're not actually holding to the law. And here they are pointing out the law. And you know what's also interesting about this is that not one of them can outdo Jesus because he knows the law way better than anyone else. He is a lawgiver. And here they are presenting to Jesus this law that, they must, that they're asking to see what Jesus will do. Another interesting thing about this, about that specific law, is, is throwing rocks the answer? Is throwing rocks the answer? We see that even in our modern day society, what's going on all around us. When people get so frustrated, so furious that they'll pick up a stone and they'll throw rocks. But you know what? That happened in John 8. It is a revelation for us today, in fact, that the question comes, is throwing rocks the answer? And of course, it's not. The answer isn't about throwing rocks. The answer isn't about the law that we must obey to the T. Yes, these are important. The law is important. But if you look at these men, they were trying to trap Jesus. And that's where it went askew. I'm going to come back to that word trap because it's an important component of this message. Furthering on, verse 6. They were using this question as a trap. It says it right there in order to have basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down, started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to him, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. This is the hinging words of Christ. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Man, the compassion of Jesus is so real in this passage. Here are two ways in which within this passage, Jesus is demonstrating compassion. First of all, all those men, all those leaders of the law, ready to stone this woman because they're saying they're following the law. Jesus says in response, Anyone who has sinned, you cast the first stone. Jesus could have continued on. He could have said, you know what your sin is? It's this. And you know what your sin is, man, over here? Your sin is this. But he doesn't reveal every single sin of these people. Rather, he says it in a broad sense to give a complete answer. Whoever is without sin, you cast the first stone. 
On top of this compassion he's showing to these leaders who are already blinded, whoever ve- they're already veiled and not listening. He's showing compassion to them. He not only does that, he shows compassion to the very woman caught in sin. Where he is the only one, he is the only judge, he is the only one without sin, he is the only one who could have thrown a stone. Jesus. And yet here he is, showing his great love, great compassion. And he says these words. How good our Lord is in his grace, in his mercy, in his compassion. Verse 8. Again, after he says those words, he stoops down, writes on the ground. I think no one knows what Jesus wrote on the ground. But I think it was a moment of pause, a right timing in which these men, these people were thinking about what was going on. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. And he was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. A lot of us know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But you know John 3, 17, the verse after that says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I think that's a powerful word, the condemnation word that's used right here in both of those passages and others in scripture. Because God did not send Jesus to condemn you of your sin. He provided the answer through Christ. Christ dying on the cross for each of our sins is the greatest demonstration of love anyone will ever see. And when we receive that, when we understand that, that I am a sinner, that Jesus loves me, that Jesus loves me so much he died on the cross, that I receive that truth into my life, that I will live for Jesus because of what he has done. When we receive that gospel into our lives, we become changed and transformed. But salvation, it may be free to us, but it wasn't free to our Lord. It cost him everything. And so in that thought of what it cost Jesus, may we not treat what Jesus has done like cheap grace. And let me define cheap grace. Cheap grace is when we just say, you know what? Yeah, Jesus died on that cross, but I'm going to live my life however I want to because, you know what? He'll forgive me anyway. That's not how God, how Jesus wants us to live. It's this concept in which we are understanding the full price that was paid and we are getting it not only in our minds, not only in our hearts, but in our hands and feet, all three of those things, heart, hands, and feet, that we will take action and live for him. And so may we be people who understand the compassion, the truth and grace of our Lord according to this passage. One last thing about this passage I want to highlight. Truth, which Jesus fully revealed, he said, go and leave your life of sin. He was telling the truth right there. But truth by itself sometimes can become legalistic. And grace by itself can sometimes become too overly accepting. Therefore, Jesus, who is the perfect example of truth and grace, he is the standard of perfection that we as Christians are trying to live by. That is how we need to live our lives as well, in truth and grace. And so may this passage point us back to that, to be people called to live in truth and grace. But here's the thing, and I bring this up again, 
In fact, Pastor Clive shared it last week, and I'm going to bring it up again about the sin, about the traps. Remember I said, save that word, traps? The leaders are trying to trap Jesus. There are traps in our lives. It's a trap. This is the one slide I made. I didn't make any other slides, but I made this slide right here. Unbelief, con- controversy, as Pastor Clive says, controversy, rejection, and opposition. These are the traps in our lives. And don't go around trying to poke these traps. The more you go towards these traps, it will spring and you're caught up. You don't want to fall into these traps. And by the way, if you do fall into the trap, get out of it. Turn back to Jesus. But here's the warning of the traps. These four words are very descriptive of things that go on around us that could trip us up. So the first one is unbelief. Unbelief is skepticism. It's a lack of faith. It's not, it's saying, you know what? I do not believe that which you are saying. So when, for example, if someone is having a conversation with you and you start denying completely, you just, I I don't believe that. It's okay to dialogue, but once your heart starts to get into that place of unbelief, you're in a dangerous place. And it furthers on to controversy, controversy. And controversy is when you start to argue, when you start to dispute, when you need to have your way as the right way. That's when it starts to get controversial. And so we see these leaders who are engaged in this crazy controversy because they are fully arguing and disputing. In fact, they go further on. The next step is rejection. They're fully refusing, dismissing, and denying whatever it is that's true. You're at that point, if you're at the point of rejection, you are not even listening at that point. And even further is opposition, where there's hostility and resistance. And so all of these things are ways in which we are trapped and we are going on a path that you are not called to live out. Remember, You are called to live your life in truth and grace together. And all of these traps are there to spring upon you. But don't engage in these traps. Focus on the Lord. And I want us to see four practical ways in which we can focus on the Lord according to this passage. The first one is how Jesus always engages us. Jesus teaches. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us. Thank you, Lord, for your word. You know, why should you go to the Arise Conference? Why should you go to Activate Prayer? Why should you go to Sunday School? Why should you be in Ohana Group or a Bible study? It's because this book, God's Word, is being taught there. And it's because Jesus is speaking these words. Yes, you may have... It, thank you, Lord, for great teachers. Because these teachers have prepared or whoever's preaching or teaching God's word, they have prepared, they have done due diligence in studying and trying their best to engage God's word with each of us. And so whenever we offer these kind of things, we are saying, come not to hear Pastor Clive or Dr. So-and-so, it's to hear God's teaching for you. And what's even neat about that is you don't have to do it alone. You can do it with other people in which you can dialogue and and talk about whatever it is. And in doing so, you'll be even more blessed and we will be blessed together. And how good it is to have Jesus' teachings right before us. Also to say, you should be studying, we should be studying this word daily. Opening it up, and not just on Sundays, but opening it up and reading it and trying to understand clearly what God has to say for us for the day. So the first practical way Jesus engages, he teaches us. The second way, Jesus reveals truth. Jesus reveals always, (laughs) always. Jesus will always reveal truth. You know, after I preach, there is one specific person who I always go to? And yes, the answer is Jesus. But also, that's a, that's a trick question. But also, 
I always go to my wife. My wife, she takes copious notes. I learned that. She's an English teacher. I learned that word. Copious means plenty for the rest of us. She takes a lot of notes. And within all of these notes that she takes, she has amazing like, application things. Like This is really applicable to me, to things like, I have no idea what you're saying. That's kind of confusing. <laughs> and she'll share these things with me. In fact, I even go to her, and I am readily go to her because, and here's the thing, she shares the truth with love. She is telling me these things, definitely the encouraging things, like I really was moved by this and encouraged and want to live more for Jesus this way. But the other things, like maybe you could have um, wore a mask while you were <laughs> preaching, or maybe you could have said it this way, or whatever it is, right? And so the truth being told in love is always going to be responsive. And, and yet truth is truth with the Lord, and because we know it's from the Lord and because we know love is connected, let us eagerly receive the truth of the Lord all the time. So when someone comes to you and if they're connected to the Lord, if they're saying with love, be blessed. Don't feel condemned. Don't feel discouraged or being a wedge between you. If truth is shared in love, what a blessing for you to hear it from that person. And so that's another way Jesus responds with truth. Jesus responds, third point, Jesus responds with compassion. Uh, did I, by the way, did I say this is my favoritist story? I know favoritist is a word that I'm making up. Sorry, my English teacher wife. Favoritist story because of the compassion of our Lord Jesus. And his compassion is so great. I love seeing compassion moments. Compassion moments when Seppe is asking for prayer for Eddie and people just chime in with all kinds of prayer because they love Eddie and they love her and they love the family. Compassion moments such as Pat Lee who responded to Karen Maluo. Karen Maluo setting up 700 produce boxes to give out. And Pat Lee intentionally thinking, I want to give this box to this family. I want to give this box to this family. I want to give this box to this family. And there's her compassionate heart to say, I'm not taking the box only for myself. I want to bless others with it. Compassionate hearts like Nelson Kanimoto, who this past week, the pastors received an email from him saying, here are three people that I met last week Sunday. And here's their stories, their backgrounds of what's going on in their lives. And can you pray for these people? I love that. He's asking for prayer for people that he met on Sunday. And his compassionate heart didn't just go up to the person to meet them, find out what's going on, but to share that with others who he believes will be praying and encouraging and building up. And that kind of compassion needs to be demonstrated more through us as Christians. We need to be able to live our lives with the law, with the things that we know are true, but also full of compassion, mercy, and love. And lastly, how Jesus engages us, Jesus calls us to forsake sin and live for him. That passage ends with Jesus telling the women caught in adultery, go now and leave your life of sin. But I believe that it's not just leaving that sin, it's also filling your life with more of Jesus. And so he calls us to do this. I share an illustration here, which I am pretty open. I share a lot of things. <laughs> but this one I, I kept to myself a little bit, and I still keep it a little closer. Because of shame. Whenever we have sin, it's always shame, right? But it's also freeing when we could share it and we could help one another along with these things. And so when I first started working here at Kalihi Union Church, the senior pastor was Pastor Peter Kamakaviva Ole. And I was in my late 20s, working, starting here as the youth guy. And there was a sin that I committed that I was really distraught over. Sin in which I had to go to my senior pastor and confess and say, you know, 
Pastor Peter, I did this wrong. And even in telling him, just full of shame and full of regret and remorse, and even thinking this could be the moment in which he says, you know what, we don't need you. Thank you for trying and coming over here. But instead, Pastor Peter taught me in that very moment. He taught me what compassion is. He didn't want me to sin. He didn't want me to continue sinning. But he said, you know what? Grace on you. I love you and I want the best in your life. He, he demonstrated this to me. He said it to me in words that I don't remember, but the, the echoes of his grace and compassion were there with me and stand with me to this day. Where he was showing me this full compassion and this full saying, you know what, now live for Christ. If you messed up, confess it to the Lord and then live for Christ. Here's a new day in which you can do that. And so these four points let us see that Jesus always engages. I told you these stories in which they're connected to all kinds of people, but let me just highlight once again that Jesus is the perfect giver of truth and grace. Jesus is the perfect one who teaches us. Jesus is the perfect one who reveals truth to us. Jesus is perfect in his compassion. Jesus is perfect in telling us, forsake sin and live for me. And so it's neat because these four points, remember two weeks ago I shared about how the gospel is not, and it's not my quote, but a pastor quoted, the gospel is not a, just a springboard in which you share about Jesus died for his sin, you need to accept him. But Jesus is not only a springboard, it's the gospel is the pool in which we are engaged in all the time. And right here is the gospel. And it builds up the teachings, the truth, the compassion, the no longer live for sin and live for Jesus. That is the full gospel that we as Christians are called to live by. And so may that be an encouragement. It has been such an encouragement for myself. May that be an encouragement for you that our Lord is so loving and so full of goodness and truth. And he's the example that we follow, and he's the one that we do it all for. In application and closing, it's on your notes, there's three application points. These three application points are for you to take home today, this week, spend time in these application points. There's three things. The first thing, may we see that truth by itself can sometimes become legalistic. Grace by itself can become too overly accepting. So what does living according to both truth and grace mean to you? When I say mean to you, I don't say, what does that mean for that friend that I have that needs more truth and grace? No, you. What does truth and grace mean to you and how you should live by? And how can you stand for truth yet respond with more grace in your life as well? The second application, may we ask the Lord, Lord, what sin do you need to sur what sin do I need to surrender to you in order for you to be glorified more? So whatever sin it is, you give it to God. It's between you and God, ultimately. And you also ask, what practical ways can Christ help you to forsake it? And we want to point out that you are not called to live your life by yourself. Number one, you will always have the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, number two is this beautiful thing called the church, the body of Christ. And we are all sinners saved by grace. We are all on this journey of life trying to focus on our Lord. And what greater way when we can do it together. And so maybe whatever sin it is, you need to share it with some trusted other people who can help you in this journey. But whatever it is, whatever sin holds you back, give it to the Lord. Surrender it to him and sin no more and he will help you. Third and last, may we pray with humility, praise, and thanksgiving in a spirit of truth and grace. Let us continue to focus upon our Lord as we hear more worship from him. Let me pray as we wrap this sermon up. 
Lord Jesus, thank you for truth and grace. Thank you so much for demonstrating it to us all the time. Thank you that you are a Lord who engages us all the time. Help us to see you. Maybe we're coming from a place in which we're desperately seeking you. Maybe we're coming from a place in which we just look up and there you are. Or maybe we're being dragged because of our sin and all the junk in our life and our only option is you. (laughs) Whatever the case, oh God, there and in between, thank you that you are always there. Thank you that you'll never leave us, never forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that you are so amazing. Be blessed, O God. Be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to know you face to face. Kneel at the throne of grace for grace.